morning. At this time, we are going to start with the victim impact statements. Mr. Markell, I understand you are going to provide it today on behalf of the family. Yes, thank you. You may speak when you're ready. Take all the time you need. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Estell Markell. I am Dan Markell's father. Dan, my only son, was born October 9, 1972, in Montreal, Quebec. During that time in Quebec, husbands were not allowed to actually be in the delivery room during a child's birth. However, since the obstetrician was a very close friend of ours, I was allowed to experience the most amazing of moments, the birth of my son. I will never forget the emergence of his head, and then those shoulders of an NFL football fullback, a boy of 10 pounds. There I was, holding in my arms this gift of life, my bundle of absolute sheer joy. From the time he was a child, my son had tremendous energy, intelligence, and great warmth. Dan had a vibrant, fun-loving personality and lived life to its fullest. Danny loved to socialize, dance, cook, entertain, and play sports, and dedicated himself wholeheartedly to everything that he did. He always looked to do his utmost to improve and achieve better results in every activity that he did. This desire of improvement and commitment to excellence was a defining characteristic of his short life. I fondly remember taking Danny skiing up the hills in the Laurentian Mountains in Quebec when he was just two years old. He rode up the mountain between my legs, holding on to the T-bar, and then coming down the ski hill, yelling with great joy, Faster, Danny! Faster! Then, as he grew a little older, he played hockey at the local park. To improve his skating skills, he requested to take a speed skating lesson with a local coach who was from Russia, and he had a very uh, a reputation of being a very tough coach. Dan persevered, and after every hockey lesson, he came off the ice with a red face, totally out of breath, because he always gave it his all. At about the age of 13, Danny developed the idea that he was going to Harvard University for his college education. He discovered that the acceptance requirements for Harvard were not only good grades, but also work for the community and charitable work. To achieve these goals, he revived his high school newspaper. He became the newspaper's editor, the business manager, and performed charitable deeds and volunteered in the community. After years of hard work and determination, Dan was accepted to Harvard. He graduated from Harvard Magna Cum Laude. He went on to study at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem for one year, and then earned a Master's of Philosophy and Political Theory from Emmanuel College at the University of Cambridge in England. He returned thereafter to Harvard School, Law School to earn his law degree, and went on to become an extremely successful lawyer, influential legal scholar. Dan served as a law clerk for a federal judge worked as an associate of the prestigious law firm in Washington, D.C., and then secured a prestigious teaching position at FSU College of Law. In a few short years, Dan became a full tenured law professor before the tender age of 41. Quite unusual. Dan co-authored a book and published many articles in highly regarded law journals, and newspapers like the New York Times. Dan's work was influential, and he gave lectures and presented at universities around the world. Although Dan was fond of his Canadian roots, he was very dedicated to the FSU Law School and the Tallahassee community. He was recognized as a scholar who contributed and made a difference in the world. While Dan's career was important to him, family, meant everything to Dan. Dan's marriage produced two boys, Benjamin and Lincoln, who were his absolute world and the love thing to him. Dan made sure that he and the boys came to much things to him. 
Dan made sure that he and the boys came to Montreal and Toronto to attend every family affair and visit with all the extended Markel family, including grandparents, uncles, aunts, and many numerous cousins. Despite the distance, <clears throat> Dan felt that the boys had to know and be a part of the family. Dan also made sure that he and the boys participated in the Tallahassee community. And they were involved in the local synagogue and neighborhood. Dan left home at the young age of 17 to go to Harvard. But he always came home for summer vacation, holidays, and all family functions. Danny and I, despite the fact that we lived quite far apart, regularly communicated by text, email, and phone calls. Despite the physical distance, as time moved on, we grew ever so much closer. At Dan's suggestion, we would plan to talk and have a meal together. At the appointed day and time, we each would prepare our meals set our tables with a tablet in the middle. And over Skype, Skype, we would sit together and enjoy each other's company for a couple of hours despite the actual distance. Dan's life was abruptly cut short and he was forever taken from me, his boys and the rest of our family and all his many friends and colleagues. My life has been in total disarray since Dan's murder. <clears throat> Many nights, I wake up in the middle of the night in a terrible sweat with thoughts of Dan's murder and all that has happened. There is not a single day in my life since Danny's death that in one way or another, he does not enter into my thoughts. And I miss him with all my heart. I am constantly reminded of Dan's murder and his absence. When I meet new people, the topic of discussion always comes up when they ask whether I have children. How do I respond? It is difficult to put into words the heinous acts that took Danny away from us. The unthinkable pain that I must live with every single day. Losing a son or a daughter is something I wish nobody, nobody should have to experience. It's not in the order of nature. <clears throat> Danny is never coming back. We continue to hope and pray for justice and the return to normalcy of seeing and playing a vital role in the lives of our two grandsons, Ben and Lee. It has been a number of years since I last wrote a victim impact statement, sharing how Danny's death has affected me. Despite our persistent efforts, we still do not have a real relationship with Danny's son, Ben and Lincoln. Visits are limited and very controlled. For six years, we were denied any and all visits with the boys. In the last two years, I've been permitted two 60 to 90 minute visits, supervised visits. This limited contact is incredibly painful. And I feel like we have cut out of our lives. Not only have I lost my son, <clears throat> but I have effectively lost two of my grandkids as well. Even their family names have been changed from Markel to Abelson. While we work hard to help introduce a new bill in the state of Florida known as the Markell Act, which gives grandparents important rights, unfortunately, our relationship with Ben and Lincoln has, been, has not been materially improved. As this bill was coming to fruition, there was a lot of negative publicity in the press and media about Daddy's ex-wife, Wendy. In my opinion, Wendy was focused on improving her public image, and as a result, extended an invitation to us to Ben's bar mitzvah. Ruth and I were invited to attend only the ceremonial part of this important stage in the Jewish boy's life. 
and we were not invited to participate in any reception typical of this celebration. But this invitation opened the door to one of the limited visits described above. In order not to not overwhelm Ben and Lincoln on this important day, we asked we asked to arrange a meeting before the Barnes in order to make things easier on the boys, who we hadn't been allowed to visit in years. We were able to arrange a brief 90 minute supervised visit with Ben and Lincoln and a few weeks before, this was a few weeks before the Bar Mitzvah. However, <clears throat> immediately after our brief visit, Charlie was arrested, and Wendy extended our invitation to the Bar Mitzvah. At the time, she said that they were going to either postpone or completely cancel this Bar Mitzvah ceremony. Neither of those happened. <clears throat> Excuse me. Instead, my understanding is that the Adelsons went on to have the bar mitzvah ceremony and party, all without the Markel family's presence or participation. Missing out on this important moment in Ben's life was incredibly painful. After so many years without them, we had hoped to make progress in forging a consistent relationship with his sons in this important life cycle of that. Dan's murder brought his life abruptly to an end for no sensible reason and has affected a countless number of people. The legal community is deprived of Dan's wisdom and ideas, which made the world a better place. Dan's students are deprived of the experience of having Dan as a brilliant professor and caring mentor, showing them a path. Dan's colleagues can no longer benefit from Dan's friendship, insights, and scholarly, scholarly discussions and debates. Ruth and I have been deprived of our son, who has been taken away from us so suddenly and totally against life's schedule. Ben and Lincoln must go through life without their father, who loved them with all his being. The boys have been deprived of their father's entire family after Dan's murder. We have no idea of what these two boys know or have been told about Danny's death. They truly believe, I truly believe that they have been brainwashed in all these years, from the ages of three and four years of age to the present day. I also have no idea what the boys know of us, the entire Martell family, our history, etc., and especially <clears throat> how much we all love them and how we wish they were active part of our family. Both groups, <clears throat> sorry. Both Ruth and I are approaching 80 years of age. At this moment, we are healthy, but one does not know what tomorrow brings. The wheels of justice turn very, very slowly, but so far we're very grateful that they're still turning. We're very grateful to Tallahassee Law Enforcement, to the state attorney and all their staff, to all our relatives and friends, including the hundreds of Danny's friends and colleagues around the world for their constant support over these long 10 years. To all the podcasters who work hard to keep alive this unbelievable story. <clears throat> we are still waiting for Benjamin and Lincoln to have a more normal relationship with the Martell family as we wait in pain and anguish. The Adelson family, in particular Charlie Adelson, has been a major cause of our heartbreak and the murder of our son Danny and the loss of our two grandsons. <clears throat> I have suffered tremendously and we as a family continue to suffer. It is satisfying to see justice being done 
and it would be appropriate to ask for the maximum sentence for the perpetrators of Danny's murder. Thank you. Today is a good day. Please rise. I'm now going to pronounce the sentence. With the jury having found you guilty of all three counts that you were charged with in your indictment, of first degree murder, conspiracy to commit first degree murder, and solicitation to commit first degree murder, I am going to adjudicate you guilty of all three at this time, and you are going to be sentenced as follows. As to count one, the first degree murder count pursuant to section 782.04 and 775.082 for the statutes, you are sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of release or parole. As to count two, you are going to be sentenced consecutively to 30 years in the Department of Corrections for a conspiracy to commit first degree murder. As to count three, you are going to be sentenced to 30 years in the Department of Corrections consecutively for solicitation to commit first degree murder.